You know that feeling uh, when you're trying to research new tech, yeah. like especially PC hardware, motherboards, maybe you just get swamped with all the specs and the jargon. Oh yeah, absolutely. Information overload is real. It really is. So consider this, well, your guide through the maze. Today we're zeroing in on one specific piece of kit that's uh, been getting some attention and just went through some serious testing. The MSI MAG X670 Tomahawk Wi-Fi motherboard. Exactly. We've got the lowdown from a really in-depth review right here. Mm. And our goal really is to pull out what actually matters for you to figure out you know, is this board the solid high performance base you need for a new build without getting totally bogged down in like super technical stuff? Right. The mission is basically, does it live up to the hype? That's the plan. Mm. See if it delivers on that promise of performance and stability. Okay, let's dive in. First impressions. What, uh, what really stood out about the look and feel of this board? Well, what's kind of interesting is its aesthetic. It's, um, it leans more towards subtle, almost industrial you know, compared to a lot of gaming boards that are just covered in RGB. Okay, so less flash. Yeah, I think gunmetal gray heat sinks some nice understated etch patterns. It gives off this vibe of, like, serious business quality build, you know, not shouting about it. Though there are some tasteful little LED accents under the IO shroud and chipset cover. Subtle lighting, I can get behind that. And the review mentioned it has this reassuring heft. You pick it up, and it just feels solid. That usually points to good quality components, heat sinks, that sort of thing. That makes sense. A bit of weight feels premium. And uh, how's the layout practical for actually putting a PC together? Oh, definitely. That's a big plus point highlighted in the review. The layout is described as sensible and spacious. Specifically, they mention good spacing between the DIMM slots, the RAM slots, and that main PCI 5.0 slot. Ah, so your big graphics card won't clash with your memory sticks. Exactly. Or if you've got a chunky CPU cooler. It avoids those really annoying clearance issues. That's a, well, it's a real headache saver during the build process. Definitely. We've all been there trying to jam things in. What about like installing the fiddly bits? M.2 drives, for instance, anything uh, to make that easier? Yes. Actually, the M.2 heat sinks were called out specifically. They use these spring-loaded clips instead of those tiny little screws that always seem to vanish. Oh, that's smart. I hate those screws. The reviewer really liked that user-friendly touch. And beyond that, just the placement of things like the power connectors, the fan headers. Hmm. It's all pretty intuitive. Helps a lot with cable management. Which isn't just about looks. It helps airflow, too. Precisely. Good airflow is key for keeping things cool. Hmm. So, yeah. Practical design all around. Okay, so practical build. Let's get to the uh, the core stuff. Power delivery. Super important for those hungry, high-end Ryzen CPUs, right? Absolutely crucial. And this is where the board seems, well, pretty serious. It's got an 80-amp SPS, that's smart power stage VRM design. Basically, a very robust power delivery system. 80 amps sounds like a lot. It is. The review even suggested it might be a bit overbuilt for you know most current AM5 chips. But what that means for you is super stable voltage going to the CPU. Rock steady, whether it's running stock or you're pushing it with an overclock. Okay, so reliability under load, that's key. Exactly, that stability is fundamental for consistent performance and frankly, for the health of your CPU long-term. Makes sense. And all that power generates heat. How did the board handle the thermals? Did the VRMs get toasty? So during really heavy stress testing, they used Cinebench R23 multi-core, pushing it hard with an AIO cooler. The VRM temps peaked in the high 70s Celsius. High 70s? Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfectly acceptable, especially for that kind of extreme load. But, and this is important for most people's actual usage, during more typical tasks like gaming or productivity work, the temps were much lower, comfortably in the mid 60s Celsius range. Ah, okay. Mid 60s sounds very comfortable indeed. So the cooling on the board itself is doing its job. It seems so. It's got these pretty large aluminum heat sinks on the VRM sections and also on the X670E chipset. And interestingly, they're linked by a heat pipe. Like a little highway for heat. Kind of, yeah. It helps spread the heat more effectively across a larger area so it can dissipate better. The reviewer tested it even in a case that wasn't ideal for airflow, sort of a worst case scenario and found no thermal throttling, no instability. It just kept running cool. Nice. Engineered to handle the pressure then. Mm -hmm. OK, let's shift gears to memory. DDR5 is kind of the big news with the AM5 platform. How's the support on this Tomahawk? Very strong, according to the review. MSI officially quotes support for, I think, boost 6600 megahertz plus DRAM, which is pretty fast. Wow, oh, OK. And the testing bore that out. They easily hit over 6,000 megahertz using standard G-Skill and Corsair kits, and importantly, with tight CL30 timings. Lower timings mean 
generally better responsiveness. Yeah. Right. Speed isn't everything. Latency matters too. Was it uh, was it difficult to get those speeds running, fiddling in the BIOS? Apparently not. Just a one-click thing in the BIOS to enable the memory profiles, yeah. you know, XMP or AMG, XPO, depending on the kit. Yeah. Super straightforward. That's what you want to hear. Yeah. And they ran extended memory tests, MemTest 86 at 6400 megahertz, yeah. and it was perfectly stable. So easy to enable and reliable once you do. Good stuff. What about for the tinkerers, people who want to push the CPU itself, overclocking potential? Yeah, the overclocking experience was also described pretty positively. The UEFI BIOS, the interface you use, is apparently well organized. MSI has this Game Boost dial feature, which offers some uh, safe preset overclocks if you just want a simple bump. Okay, easy mode. Right. But then for the more adventurous, there are plenty of manual controls, granular stuff like SOC voltage for core, frequency tuning, all that jazz. So options for everyone. Did they manage a decent overclock in the review? They did. They got a high-end Ryzen 9 7950X up to 5.4 gigahertz on all cores. Needed a moderate voltage increase, of course, but they noted the thermal impact wasn't too bad. It handled it well. 5.4 all core is pretty tasty. Sounds like a capable board for overclocking them. Yeah. Seems like it caters well to both beginners and seasoned tweakers. Cool. Okay, let's talk storage. Drives. Modern games, applications. They need fast storage. What's the Tomahawk packing for M2s and things? It's definitely ready for the latest and greatest there. It's got two M.2 Gen 5 slots. That's the really fast stuff. Gen 5. One slot is connected directly to the CPU, which gives you the absolute maximum bandwidth, and the other runs to the chipset. Both have those substantial heat sinks we mentioned earlier. Keep those speedy drives from overheating. Did they test the speeds? Yep. They used a drive based on the Fizen E26 controller. That's one of the top Gen 5 controllers right now in that primary CPU link slot. Uh -huh. And they were seeing sequential read speeds around 11,000 megabytes per second. 11,000. Wow. That's oh. flying. Yeah. It's seriously fast loading times for your OS, games, applications. Big difference in, you know, day-to-day -day responsiveness. I bet. What if you need more storage than just those two Gen 5 slots? Any other options? Plenty. Beyond those two, you also get two more M.2 slots, but these are PCIe 4.0. Still very fast, mind you. And then you've got six traditional SATA 6 grams ports for older SSDs or mechanical hard drives. So lots of flexibility for storage expansion down the line. Definitely. And it's not just storage. The PCIe slot situation is good, too. There's the main reinforced PCIe 5.0 by a 16 slot for your graphics card, then another full length by 16 slot, though it runs it by four speed electrically, plus two smaller by one slots. Good for adding things like, I don't know, capture cards or sound cards, maybe. Exactly. Plenty of room for expansion beyond just the GPU and storage. Okay. It sounds well equipped internally. How about connecting to the outside world? Networking, Wi Fi, Ethernet? It's got both covered and pretty well. There's integrated Wi Fi 6E, that's the latest standard with the 6 gigahertz band and also a fast 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. Wi-Fi 6E is nice if you have a compatible router. How did it perform? The Wi-Fi uses an Intel AX210 module, which is a solid, reliable chip. The reviewer connected it to a 6 gigahertz mesh network and said the performance was basically indistinguishable from a wired connection for most things. Really strong signal. That's impressive. Cuts down on cable clutter without a speed penalty. Yeah, and they like the antennas too. They're detachable and you can angle them to get the best reception. A nice little touch. Good design. What about USB ports? Always need plenty of those. What's on the back panel? It's pretty stacked. You get two of the really fast USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 Type-C ports. One of those actually has an internal header too, so you can connect it to a Type-C port in the front of your case, which is handy. Oh, nice. Front panel Type-C is becoming essential. Totally. Then there are multiple USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A ports. Those are the 10 GVPs ones, and several slower Gen 1 ports as well. So. A good mix for all your peripherals. Sounds comprehensive. Yeah. Anything else back there worth noting? Yeah, one really useful feature is the BIOS flashback button. Ah, uh, the lifesaver button. Exactly. If you somehow mess up a BIOS update, or maybe you buy a new CPU that needs a newer BIOS version than the board shipped with, this lets you flash the firmware, even without a CPU or RAM installed, can save you a massive headache. Huge relief when you need it. Okay, nearly forgot audio. How's the onboard sound? Good enough? Or will audiophiles need a separate card? For most people, it should be pretty good. It uses the Realtek ALC4080 codec, which is generally considered a high-quality onboard audio chip these days. Better than the basic stuff, then. Definitely. MSI pairs it with decent-quality capacitors 
and the audio circuitry is physically isolated on the PCB to try and reduce electrical noise or interference. Does it make a difference? The reviewer tested it with some studio headphones and reported uh, good clarity, strong bass response. So yeah, a solid onboard solution to let you have really high-end, demanding audio gear. Okay, good to know. It really seems like they've covered most bases. What about the software experience? BIOS usability, Windows utilities? MSI's Click BIOS 5 generally gets good marks for being pretty intuitive. It has the two modes, an EZ mode for the basic stuff, setting fan speeds, boot order, enabling XMP or XPO, simple things. Right, the quick access stuff. And then the advanced mode, where you can dive deep into voltages, set up NVMe RAID, control PCIe bifurcation, all the complex options. Anything stand out in the BIOS itself? One feature they mentioned liking was the integrated hardware monitor screen lets you track your temps and voltages in real time while you're still in the BIOS, which can be useful for diagnosing things or during overclocking. Handy. And what about Windows software? Does MSI bundle anything? Yeah, there's the MSI Center software. It's kind of an all-in-one utility for managing fan curves, controlling any RGB lighting you might have connected, setting up system performance profiles, that kind of thing. Is it any good? Sometimes that bundled software can be a bit bloated. That's off to the critique, yeah. The reviewer found it generally stable, which is an improvement over maybe some older versions of these things. But they did note it could be a bit slow to load sometimes, and maybe some options felt a little duplicated within the interface. Yeah. But overall, usable. Okay, so functional, if not perfect. Fair enough. Let's talk brass tacks then. Value. Where does this board sit price-wise, and how does it stack up? Right now, spring 2025, it seems to be hovering around the... Uh, 320 to 350 pound mark. So that puts it firmly in the sort of premium mid-range, maybe upper mid-range category for X670 boards. So not cheap, but not the absolute top end price either. Exactly. You can definitely spend more, get boards with even more niche features, maybe more M.2 slots or Thunderbolt. And you can certainly spend less if you don't need Gen 5 support or quite such a robust VRM. But for this price point, is it competitive? The review argues pretty strongly that yes, it is. They felt that few other boards in this specific price bracket offer quite the same blend of that really high-quality VRM, the modern connectivity Wi-Fi 6E, 2.5 gig Ethernet, Gen 5 storage, and a BIOS that's both powerful and easy to use. So it hits a sweet spot. Seems like it. Yeah. If positioned as a really strong choice, if your priority is, say, content creation or stable overclocking or just building a system you want to last and maybe upgrade components in later, it's less about the RGB gamer aesthetic and more about the, well, the substance. Substance over style, perhaps? That's a good way to put it. Okay, so after digging through all that detail, what's the final word? The overall verdict on the MSI MAG X670E Tomahawk Wi-Fi. The conclusion from the review is pretty clear. This board nails the fundamentals. Oh. It prioritizes performance, stability, and solid engineering over, you know, flashy gimmicks. Right. Its biggest strengths are definitely that powerful VRM, the excellent DDR5 support and overclocking headroom, the cutting-edge M2 Gen 5 storage capabilities, and that reliable Wi-Fi 6E. Plus, points for the easy build process and the user-friendly BIOS, too. And stability was solid throughout testing. Rock solid, apparently. No issues reported. So even though it's not the cheapest board out there, the feeling is it's a really worthwhile investment if you're building around a high-end Ryzen CPU and you want something dependable that'll serve you well for years. It kind of just does everything well. A strong all-rounder in a market that sometimes focuses too much on just one thing. Exactly. It avoids the pitfalls of being too specialized, offering a really balanced feature set. Okay, so the clear takeaway seems to be the MSI MAG X670 Tomahawk Wi-Fi. It's a really well-balanced, high-performing motherboard. Delivers a lot for its price point, actually. I mean, it's a very solid foundation for a modern AMD build. Precisely. It really makes the case that sometimes the best tech isn't the loudest or the flashiest. It's the one that just quietly gets the job done, reliably and capably, day in, day out. That's a great point. And, you know, it makes you think, with motherboards like this pushing performance, handling super fast Gen 5 storage, what's the next bottleneck going to be in high performance computing? Is it going to be the CPUs hitting a wall? Or maybe, I don't know, memory bandwidth? Or something else entirely we haven't even really thought about yet for typical desktop use? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. Food for thought, definitely. Absolutely. Well, thanks for diving deep into this one with me today.